My name is Eugene Silberstein, and I'm the lead author of Cengage Learning's Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technology title, as well as a member of North Park Innovation's Technical Advisory Team. As an educator with over 25 years in front of the classroom, I've learned a few things about conveying content to students. It's simply not enough to know a lot about a particular topic. Our goal as instructors should be to present content in a manner that makes it easy for our students to absorb and internalize content so they can ultimately become successful in our ever-changing industry. Put simply, are our students picking up what we're putting down? Students all learn differently. Some learn best by reading, some by hearing, and still others by seeing. Most people learn by more than one of these methods. Historically though, those in the HVAC, our industry, especially those who actually work on the equipment, tend to learn best by seeing and doing. So it's one thing to lecture about an air conditioning, refrigeration, or heat pump system, but to actually show your students the internal workings of a system is something completely different. Effective instructors have the ability to paint graphic pictures with their words, but even the best artists need paint and a brush every so often. Because of this, it is in the instructor's best interest, as well as in the best interest of the students, to utilize training aids that support and enhance the educational process. The purpose of this session is to provide instructors with some useful and visual teaching tips and ideas that will help them provide well-rounded training for their students. With us today is Nick Good. He's one of the engineers over at iConnect Training. How's it going, Nick? Good, thanks, Eugene. Awesome, man. You know, I think we can all agree that that inverter-controlled mini-split systems, they're, they're everywhere, and they're one of the fastest-growing sectors in our, our industry. You know, these units are desirable because when they're sized right and installed right, they can easily match the load on a space being conditioned. And one of the neat features of mini split systems is that the outdoor units uh, of these systems are quite small when you're comparing them to conventional split systems. Uh, and although this is great from, from a construction and installation standpoint, uh, it, it can pose problems from, from a training perspective. Uh, if you're teaching about all the important mini split system uh, components, it's often difficult or impossible to have your students crowding around a, a single piece of equipment. You know, I mean, Nick, you're a big guy, but you know, that unit next to you looks pretty small. So <laughs> if you're, yeah, if you're trying to imagine all your students crowding around, that could definitely pose some problems. You know, as an educator, I mean, how many times have you, while standing in front of a class or doing a, a training session, you know, held up a small part and said, I know you guys can't see this, but if you could, and, and that poses a problem uh, with training, especially for, for groups of students. You know, you get the idea. But the, the very nature of, of an outdoor unit of a mini split makes it difficult to show your students the actual details of the system. So, and as students try to get closer and closer, it becomes more and more difficult for, for others to see. And if students can't see what's going on, they're going to lose interest, they're going to wander off, and the whole educational process tends to fall apart. Uh, in my opinion, this is why having an exploded system would, would be such a really big help when it comes to training. And, and Nick, if you could point out, I mean, all, all the guts of that, of that outdoor unit, I mean, they're all off to the side. You know, I don't know if you're able to hop over there, but yeah, I mean, you know. Yeah, so we pulled out the compressor. We've got two sight glasses behind that going into the outdoor unit and at the outlet. When we've also extended out our service ports with the electronic expansion valves full display. Yeah, and you know what? That's pretty cool because with an exploded system, it's a lot easier to show the parts that actually make up the unit. And, and this, you know, and students can step back now, making room for others, others to see. When teaching mini splits, it's it's often important to stress the differences between the mini split and a conventional split system. And one of the main differences is that the metering devices on a mini split are located within the outdoor unit, all right? 
Uh, Nick, can you uh, you have access to those? Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So You're gonna be able to. Yeah, so the metering devices are outside. So this, the fact that the metering devices are in different locations, if you're talking about a mini split system or a conventional system, this opens up the discussion with your students about the state of the refrigerant in the tubing that makes up the line set. Because when the metering devices are inside, now you have liquid refrigerant flowing into the metering devices, whereas the metering device is being outside, now the line leading inside contains saturated refrigerant. So having an exploded view and exploded system also makes evaluating your students a lot easier. And as an instructor, I would always point out to my students, you know, what's the state of refrigerant at this point of the system? What refrigerant, you know, what's the direction of refrigerant flow in this line? And if you're doing that on a mini split system, a conventional mini split, it's a lot tighter and it's more difficult for your students to point out. Having an exploded system also makes evaluating your students much easier. As students are beginning their training, instructors often point to various points in the system and ask them to identify the state of the refrigerant at that point and also the direction of refrigerant flow. And if an instructor is trying to evaluate a student on a actual mini split system, things can get a little cramped and it'll be more difficult for the student to identify particular points and directions. So with an exploded system, it actually makes it a lot easier for the students to grasp the concepts of refrigerant flow and also be able to demonstrate those concepts to the, to the teacher. So this is actually pretty cool. And, you know, and, and Nick, I, mean, I don't know, I mean, on, on the right side of that trainer, you have the, basically the, the end panel. So, you know, where the service valves are. Nick, can you just point out the, the, the service panel on the other side? So the service panel is here all the way at the end. So then you can see that, I don't know if you can see it, the two service ports here. And then right here are the two EEVs. Yeah, so, you know, from a, from a teacher and student standpoint, you know, a layout of a unit like this actually makes it really, really easy for the student to visualize what's going on inside, inside that outdoor unit. And, and another thing that's really neat is when, you're, uh, when we're teaching heat pump technology, and this is a heat pump system, uh, you know, the reversing valve becomes a main teaching point. And because the reversing valve is the main difference between a conventional air conditioning system and a heat pump. And again, having an exploded system like this makes it much easier for students to see, you know, the heat pump operation and, and the reversing valve itself. Can you just point out that? Yep, the so right valve. here is the reversing valve and then following all the line sets, then we have the gauges at each line set. So we have four separate gauges there. Yeah, and you know, with, with an exploded system, it, it's really easy to see what the piping connections are on that reversing valve. So like Nick just mentioned, the compressor's discharge is, is piped directly to the isolated port on that reversing valve. And they can see that the center port on the reversing valve is, is piped directly to the line that carries suction gas back to the compressor. And as an exercise for the students, you know, they can be asked to trace out all four of the ports and identify exactly where they go on the system. So as we, as we get deeper into the reversing valve, you know, the students will be able to see that it's the, it's the function of those two end ports on the valve and whose function changes when the system's mode of operation changes. And lecturing about how the reversing valve changes its position is, you know, is nice, it's, it's required. But when students can actually see what's, what's happening to the system pressures and temperatures in real time is something else. I mean, how, would, how neat would it be, Nick, it, for your students to see how the pressures in the reversing valve change as the mode of operation changes? You know, so I mean, maybe, we could, maybe we could check that out. Because as Nick just mentioned, this, the reversing valve on this unit has four gauges and the four gauges are connected 
at each of the four ports on the reversing valve. And uh, can, you, can you quickly point those out, man? Yep. So right here is our discharge gauge. Then we've got our suction gauge. And then two high pressure gauges for each side of the reversing valve. Yeah, so with the with the uh, with these gauges attached to all four of those ports, you can actually see the pressure that's you know what what pressure we're realizing, what pressure we're seeing in each of those uh, in each of those lines. So remember that one port is always connected to the compressor's discharge, and one port is always connected to the compressor suction. So when the system is operating the pressures that are displayed on those gauges will always, for the most part, remain constant. But it's the other gauges that are gonna show differences. So are we able to, uh, to start that system up in, in cooling? Yeah. <clears throat> I think we have a couple minute delay. Ah, but that works. should fire up. <laughs> yeah, so what we can expect to see is that in the cooling mode, refrigerant is going to be flowing directly from the compressor to the outdoor coil. And I just saw the fan start up, yep. the outdoor unit. Yeah. So, so that line, all right. So we have the line from the compressor going into the reversing valve. And that is measuring our, uh, that's our high pressure. So that gauge is going to be measuring high pressure as well as the line that's carrying refrigerant to that outdoor coil. So that gauge uh, is also going to be measuring high pressure. And from there, the refrigerant is going to be flowing to the indoor units. And then from the indoor units, the suction will be flowing back to the compressor. So we're going to have two high pressure readings on, the, on two of those gauges, as well as two low pressure readings. And, and this is how those pressures are going to sit you know, in the cooling mode. And then what's going to happen is once the system's up and running, are we running up and cooling? Yep. Yep. We're running. Awesome. And cooling. Awesome. So we have, uh, we have four analog gauges on that unit. And so right now we're looking at a, the high side pressure about 256, low side pressure about 110. Yeah, so, so remember that one of these ports is always connected to the compressor's discharge line and one port is always connected to the suction. So the pressures that are displayed on these two gauges will always, yeah, for the most part, remain the same regardless of the mode of system operation. And, and this is where the, the fun starts. With the system operating in the cooling mode, Nick, you know, we could see that the port that's connected to the compressor's discharge line is registering high pressure and so is the port that's carrying refrigerant from the reversing valve to the outdoor unit. So those two pressure gauges, you can see they're reading about 270 PSIG. And we can also see that the line that's carrying refrigerant from the indoor units back to the reversing valve and the line that's carrying suction gas back to the compressor are both sitting about 97 PSI. So we have those two high pressure lines and the two lower pressure lines. And that's in the cooling mode. And when we switch this bad boy over to the heating mode, the discharge line that's carrying refrigerant into the reversing valve, as well as that port that's carrying suction gas back to the compressor, those pressure readings are gonna remain the same. So Nick, if we could swap that unit over to, uh, to the heating mode, then we're going to be actually able to see something really, really neat for our students because your students are now going to see that although the discharge port and the suction port on that reversing valve have pressures that are not changing, those two end pressures, the pressures that we're reading on those gauges on opposite ends of that reversing valve, they're going to be switching in real time. What else is really, really cool about this is... There it goes. Yeah, man. What's actually really cool about this too, and I don't know if you can hear it, but not only will the students be able to see that reversing valve, you know, switch, you know, they'll see the pressures change, but they'll also be able to hear it. 
So uh, what I sometimes do with my students, and this is really, really cool with an exploded system, is within reason, I would have my students touch the lines and they would feel the hot line get cold and the cold line get hot. And that's actually pretty cool. And, you know, to further drive home the operation of this reversing valve, you know, we can actually connect thermocouples to each of the four ports on the reversing valve. And, and that's a little safer than actually having students grab the, uh, grab the refrigerant lines, especially when we're talking about a discharge line. Uh, I would always tell my students, if you grab a, a refrigerant line and your flesh sticks to it, that's the discharge line. But don't, don't do that with your students. So yeah, so anyway, so to, so to, to further drive home the, the operation of the reversing valve, thermocouples can be connected to each of those four ports on the valve. And in a similar manner that we just discussed with the, with the pressures, you can now show your students that the temperatures of these lines change. So again, when we were in the cooling mode, we had refrigerant flowing from the compressor to the condenser, the outdoor coil and cooling, and then flowing back from the indoor units back to the compressor and, and cooling as well. And those were the low pressure lines. So instead of looking at the pressures, we can now actually look at the temperatures of those lines. So in addition to seeing the pressures change between high pressure and low pressure, we'll actually be able to see the temperatures change. So that discharge line in cooling is actually going to become a suction line in, in heating. So once again, you know, giving our students the ability to, to sense, to see, to feel, to hear, really, really enhances the, the learning process for these guys. So, um, so yeah, that's actually pretty cool. So yeah, if you take a look at those gauges, you're gonna see, and again, that, that creates that little aha moment. Uh, you know, that creates that aha moment for your students. So they're, uh, they're actually able to see that. And, and one thing that's, that's really cool, Nick, if the, uh, in addition to showing the normal operation of a heat pump systems reversing valve, you know, it would be really, really neat if we could demonstrate the effects of a, of a leaking reversing valve. And, and with that valve operating properly, you know, we just said we have two lines that are high pressure and those two lines are hot. And then we have two low pressure lines that are, that are cold. So one way to help your students evaluate the reversing valve is to use a temperature reading method where a properly operating valve will have two high temperature or two hot lines, as well as two cold lines. Sometimes reversing valves generate internal leaks. And if a reversing valve has an internal leak, the high pressure refrigerant is going to leak through the valve to the low pressure side. So what's gonna happen with the temperatures of those lines is you're still going to have two high temperature lines and that'll be the line leading from the compressor going into the reversing valve and the line leading the reversing valve going into the uh, condenser coil. The other two lines, one of them will be cold and that's the line carrying refrigerant from the indoor unit. And then that, that common suction line, the line that's carrying refrigerant back to the compressor, instead of being cold, is going to be warm. And this helps drive this point home to your students because the, the high pressure, high temperature gas from the compressor that's flowing to the condenser coil is also going to be leaking through the valve. And that refrigerant is going to mix with that suction gas before it actually flows back to the compressor. And again, you know, th this is really, really neat because you're able to, to show this on an exploded system. And again, in a way where, where students can, can visualize and see what's going on without necessarily being on, on top of each other. Uh, and, and it's also a really good idea to have a means to, uh, you know, to display this information so your students can uh, access it or even see it remotely. And uh, again, it, it's all about creating a visual experience where they're able to see, to hear, uh, when safe touch. But uh, 
But yeah, so that's up with the reverse valve. Also, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit later about uh, electrical issues. But another electrical issue that's that's linked right back to this reversing valve is, is the coil itself. And, you know, being able to electrically test the reversing valve coil. You know, typically if, if there's a, a service-related problem where a system won't switch over from heating to cooling, uh, quite often that might be the, uh, the fault of the reversing valve not switching. And what causes the reversing valve to switch? Right, the solenoid coil that's controlling the operation of that, of that valve. So, you know, we'll, we'll circle back on to that. But, you know, Nick, with that, that system running, I just, you know, just thought about, you know, you got side classes on that unit. And, you know, what's really, really cool with, with side classes, especially, you know, the, the long side classes, it, it gives uh, your students an opportunity to see not only the state of the refrigerant, but also how fast that refrigerant is, is moving through the lines. And, and I would do that with my students. And I would do this long before we actually started up a, a system, but I would have my students put their finger in the air and, and have them move their finger as fast as they thought the refrigerant was actually moving in the system. And most of the time, at least 90, 95% of the time, the students would put their finger in there and they, and they would move it like this. And, and they always thought that the refrigerant was moving at like lightning speed. And it was actually kind of neat. And I would, I would actually group my students, uh, whether they thought the refrigerant was moving really, really slowly, like the, you know, or somewhere mid range and then, the, and then the, uh, the flash guys. And I would put them in three groups. And I would actually give them a little opportunity to discuss amongst themselves, you know, why they thought they were right, why they thought the refrigerant was moving at a snail's pace or, or why they thought the refrigerant was moving at lightning speed. And then, you know, once we had our classroom discussion, uh, then I would turn the unit on and, and actually allow the students to watch that refrigerant flowing through the cycle. And they could see the refrigerant moving through the system. And the guys that were, were doing the, you know, the lightning speed were kind of shocked to see that the refrigerant wasn't moving as fast. And then we had the students who were, you know, kind of shocked that the refrigerant was moving a little bit faster than they thought. And, uh, you know, in actuality, you know, you have a refrigerant moving through a, through a system, probably about maybe uh, 300 feet or actually, no, not even, about five feet per second, actually. Uh, it, it depends between five and eight feet, depending if you have a liquid line or a gas line. And, and it's actually kind of neat. So the, the actual speed, you're probably looking about, you know, something like this. And uh, I don't know, if, you know, were you surprised, Nick, the first time you saw refrigerant flowing through a system? through a side well, I, side? Yeah, I think a little bit. Um, and what's nice, uh, you, you can see it here. So you can see both of these wall units, the wall unit and the cassette, we've got the hot gas going in and we've got our liquid coming out. And you can see that pace coming through both of the sight glasses. Yeah, and you know, tip, and the speed of liquid and, and gas are not the same. You know, on a, on a typical air conditioning system, you know, your vapor speed is, is quicker than your liquid speed. And, and having the ability to show the difference between the two is actually a really good uh, learning tool because when we're teaching our students, when they're starting out and they're learning the basic refrigeration cycle and they're learning about compressors, condensers, metering devices, and evaporators, you know, we as instructors aren't really concentrating on the, the speed of refrigerant as it's moving through the system. So what's neat to be able, to, you know, when, when you're able to see the actual refrigerant moving, that, that really uh, lends itself to, to more advanced discussions of the refrigeration process and, and why we want vapor refrigerant to be traveling faster than liquid. And primarily that's to, to carry oil. If the vapor refrigerant's not moving that fast, um, the oil uh, tends to not flow as well. And you know what, that brings up another point. Having side classes on a system such as those 
you're actually able to see you can actually see the waves of oil you know if, if the light is just right you can actually see the the oil flowing and, and that opens up an interesting conversation between instructor and students about the the purpose of refrigeration oil and if you ask your students about what's the purpose of refrigeration oil compressor oil and you know the answer that you're going to get from your students most of the time is going to be well, to, to lubricate the compressor. And that's definitely true. But, you know, roughly 5% of the refrigerant that's, you know, in the system is actually flowing throughout the system, helping to keep other system moving parts, thermostatic expansion valves and the like operating, operating well. So, uh, so that's actually really, really cool. Um, what else do we have? You know, I, I mentioned those, those metering devices and, and the fact that they're they're located outside, and, and that's really really important. And you know, our students need to understand that not every system is the same. And the the takeaway is you can have systems, you can have units that have the same model number and serial numbers off by one. Once those systems are installed, the refrigerant line lengths are going to be different. The Air distribution system is going to be different. Of course, on a ductless split, we don't have to be concerned with that. But the charging is going to be different. So even if we have two identical systems, the operating characteristics of those units are going to be different. So especially with mini splits, you know, it, it's really important that students look at each system as, as a unique piece of equipment. In, in our industry, memorization doesn't work. And, and as instructors, I encourage you to uh, teach your students about the importance of applying a general set of rules that will apply to all systems and not simply memorize. If we memorize, we forget. And every system that you are preparing your students to work on will be unique. You know, that, that, that brings me you know, to the electrical side of things because most teachers, we, we teach our, our students about being able to evaluate or identify the terminals on a compressor and identify the start terminals, the run terminals, the common terminals, and, and also troubleshoot compressors. And you know, if you're like most teachers, and if you're like me, I had shelves in my labs that had many, many, many compressors on them. And some compressors were operational. Some compressors were uh, defective. Some had open windings, some had shorted windings, some had grounded windings. And based on what we were teaching, we would pull certain compressors off the shelves. And the challenge with that was, number one, we were storing you know, multiple compressors. And a more important challenge was that our students were really, really smart at memorizing and learning which compressor had which failures. So trying to uh, evaluate my students to see if they knew how to identify a shorted winder, an open winding or, or a grounded compressor uh, was, was kind of useless because the students would remember, oh yeah, that, you know, that compressor right there, you know, that one's got the shorted winding or that compressor's got the grounded winding. And, and for years I was always like, I was always wondering, wouldn't it be great if I could have a single compressor that I could make exhibit symptoms of different compressor failures? And, and what's neat is with, with this compressor uh, that's on this exploded system, um, we can evaluate the terminals of the compressor um, you know, uh, I'm really happy because, I mean, this compressor, we have a, an isolation switch, a switch that'll isolate the compressor electrically from the system. So we can actually have a fully functional compressor in an operating piece of equipment. And then, you know, with, with literally the flip of a switch, now isolate the compressor so students can check the terminals, identify common start and run. And that would mimic a operational compressor, although it's not operating. 
And then in addition, have that same compressor exhibit faults. Have that compressor look like a compressor with an open winding, a shorter winding, or a ground winding. And, and that's really neat from, a, from an evaluation standpoint because students talk. You know, a student comes up to me and, and uh, I give them an, an evaluation. I give them a practical exam. And I say, okay, well, check the terminals on this compressor. And they determine that that compressor has shorter windings. And, and they walk away. Their classmate uh, is walking up to me. And as they pass, the one student who just took the, the practical whispers to the other one, oh, that compressor has a shorter winding. And now that student comes up to me. And before they even put the meter on the terminals, they, they're able to tell me that the, that the compressor has a shorter winding. But, uh, but if you're able to actually, with a little creativity and ingenuity, uh, you can actually make a compressor exhibit multiple, multiple symptoms and be a fully operational compressor that is or is not operating. And again, also simulate grounded windings, shorter windings, open windings. So, uh, so yeah, so all a student would need would be a digital multimeter and be able to check the windings. And uh, we have access to the, uh, to the terminals on that compressor, Nick. We do. <clears throat> so I can just pop this cap off and, and they'll be open. Yeah. So, so again, you know, if by limiting the amount of compressors you actually have in your lab, in your shop, you know, you definitely uh, pave the way for you know, for other, for other training goodies that, that you might want. But, but on the electrical front, you know, if, if you're working with a piece of equipment and you're, you're giving your students practicals or you're troubleshooting uh, systems and you're teaching your students troubleshooting uh, skills, you, you definitely want to be able to incorporate different uh, faults and, and ba basically put different problems into the system so this will help keep your students on their toes. This will help keep them learning. If the, if the teaching gets stale, the learning will get stale. And we need to constantly stimulate our students because in the field, they're never going to see the same system twice. They're always gonna be working on something different. The problems they're going to be encountering are different all the time. So being able to uh, alter system conditions is going to be valuable. So troubleshooting and evaluating defective motors, outdoor motors, indoor motors, defective compressors, um, even being able to identify where wires or conductors have uh, been damaged all right, that's a big one. And, and Nick, I think you're able to, uh, you know, to kill or de-energize outdoor fan motors. Yeah, so I have a lot of um, toggle switches hidden inside this box. So then the instructor can just open that box and close that box so the students won't get, they won't understand what's what the fault is before they have to diagnose themselves. So if I wanted to come in here and kill the signal wire between the cassette and the outdoor unit, I could just flick my switch, close this box and have the students go in and try and diagnose what's wrong. Okay, so the student can't like look at a switch and say, oh yeah, that's the problem. You know, they're not right. able to do that, right? Yeah, that, that's actually pretty cool because that would be uh, that that would kind of defeat the purpose. But yeah, so you, you always want to keep your students on the on their toes. You want them to to experience different things. You want to uh, prevent students from becoming familiar in their surroundings in the classroom and in the lab, because again, the more students know, the uh, the less the less in-depth the training can be when they know that there are limited, uh, limited options. So for example, when, when I was teaching, I had uh, maybe five or six different refrigerants in my storage locker. And I would do a, a, 
an exercise with my students where they would gauge up on a tank of refrigerant and, and the tank of refrigerant was in a box. So they couldn't see the tank of refrigerant and they would have to, based on the temperature in the lab and the pressure in the tank of refrigerant, they would have to identify what refrigerant was in the box. Well, if I only had five different refrigerants, I only had five different possibilities. So, so what I had done was I made up mock gauges and I could set those gauges to any pressure I wanted. So I could literally simulate dozens of refrigerants based on different pressures at, at ambient temperatures and without actually having that refrigerant on hand. So, so it's really, really important that we're able to, to change the, the problem uh, because like I said, uh, not a whole lot of learning goes on if you have a unit and the unit has the same problem in and out. And you know what, Nick, one other, one other really cool thing and is the, the refrigeration circuit on a system is sealed. So the refrigerant that's in the system is the refrigerant that's in the system. It's the pressures in the system that are dependent on the temperatures that are acting on the system. So we have outside ambient air acting on the refrigerant in the outdoor coil. We have air in the conditioned space acting on the indoor coils. And it's those temperatures that are acting on the system that are going to determine the operating pressures in the system. So in addition to the temperature of these um, of the air, it, there's also an issue with the, with the quantity of air. So on an air conditioning system, uh, if an air filter gets dirty, that's gonna cause system pressures to drop. If the outdoor coil gets dirty, that's gonna cause system pressures to rise in the cooling mode. On a heat pump system, blocked outdoor coil is gonna cause operating pressures to, uh, to drop. Yeah, so, so yeah, Nick, so as I was mentioning, the, you know, that, that system is sealed. So it's the, it's the ambient temperatures that are, that are acting on that system that ultimately determine what the pressures in that system are gonna be. And, you know, not only the temperatures of the outside air and the indoor air, but also the airflow. If we don't have sufficient air moving through those coils, that's gonna affect the, the operating pressures of the system. So like on, a, on an air conditioning system, a straight cooling system, if you have a dirty air filter, you know, that's going to cause the system pressures to, to drop. And if you have a dirty outdoor coil, uh, that's going to cause the high pressure, you know, the system pressures to rise, especially on the, you know, in, in the cooling mode and the heating mode, obviously it's going to be reversed. But um, so Nick, what do you got? What can you do to, uh, you know, like simulate a dirty outdoor coil, for example? Example, you know, can, can you so like what we talked about, we have our fault switches that we can kill the fan motors in the cassette, the high wall unit, and the outdoor unit. Yeah, but question for you, bro. I, uh, if you kill that outdoor fan, right, the students are going to look at it and they'll be like, oh, yeah, well, the outdoor fan's not, you know, not that's running. A good point. So that's kind of <laughs> like, you know, a no brainer. What do you got for me, man? So if I spin that around, you can see here, so we've got an adjustable louver set behind the outdoor unit. So I can restrict airflow at different stages or completely shut it off. So now as we're in heat pump mode, that's running as our evaporator, you'll see our pressure start to drop, our saturation temperature is gonna decrease. And you know, actually, actually, that's pretty cool. Now I wish I was back in the classroom because when I wanted to simulate reduced airflow through the condenser coil, uh, I would grab a piece of corrugated cardboard or a piece of wood and, and set it on the unit or, or block the coil. But um, 
actually what I like about that is did did you see when you just did that, were there like different positions where you could block it? Yep, so we can do any sort of partial partial blockage here. Leave it open a little bit to allow a little bit more airflow across that coil. You know, I, I just got a really, really good idea because how many how many positions do you have for that? Or is that just wherever you want to set it? Are, the, are those unique settings? Um, they are unique settings across this chain. So there's probably around seven or eight different openings from wide open to, to closed. You know what? That's actually pretty cool because you can actually uh, have a student, you know, set the that louver fully open and evaluate system pressures and temperatures and then partially close it and repeat the set of readings, close it some more, take a set of readings, close it some more, take a set of readings. And they can actually start plotting that out so they could see exactly the effects of, of airflow through the outdoor coil on, on system performance and system operation. And uh, actually, Nick, I see up there, there's another uh, wall unit. I only saw that cassette earlier. So what you right, got Right, so it's a, we have multi-heads. So we have the indoor cassette and the indoor high wall unit here. Neat. Need to put electric motor on that and we can drive it around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you guys have four, uh, four field installed refrigerant lines, right? Two go into the uh, cassette and two go into that high wall? Yes. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Nick, it's actually funny because when I was teaching air conditioning a thousand years ago, we had a lot of live equipment and every piece of equipment had one problem with it. And again, that goes back to what I was saying as far as you know, being able to incorporate multiple problems in a piece of equipment because when students went to that one piece of equipment, they knew that that evaporator fan motor was bad. And then when they went over to this piece of equipment, you know, they know that that one had a dirty coil. And it, uh, like I said, it kind of lost its effectiveness when the students knew what the problem was even before they got to the piece of equipment. You know, oh, you're going to be working on this, you know, 40HA16B3. Oh, yeah, that's the one with the grounded compressor. So I actually think this is, this is pretty cool uh, that you're able to put multiple problems into a system and so the students won't know exactly what they're dealing with until until they're actually dealing with it. But uh, anything else you want to point out on that bad boy? <laughs> well, while we're still running in heat pump mode, we can take a look at these sight glasses. So without any faults incorporated, so on a good running system, you, we can see I've got my high temperature, high pressure vapor going in to this cassette with a trace of oil going through there. And we've got just about a solid column of liquid coming back out. So, they're, so my high wall unit on the other side and my cassette are both acting as the condenser. And this is, they're both looking at identical. So I've got my solid column of liquid coming back out and my vapor entering it in from the discharge of the compressor. Yeah, I mean, being able to see what's going on actually inside the, the refrigerant lines is... Uh is really, really cool. What, what's that, what's behind your head, the, the screen? On the big TV display here, just to okay. display um, our iManifold app or digital set of gauges to the entire classroom. So as you were talking about before, um, with the students all huddled around, it's just a better display for a full classroom. Very, very cool. All right, Nick, so, so we, we discussed a lot of, you know, a lot of things that teachers can do to, to enhance the learning process and, and the experience for, for our students. But uh, what, else, what else you got that I didn't ask you about? Well, so this is going to come with our iManifold service tool for the HVAC contractor technician. Um, so we've got our low pressure, high pressure probes with pipe strap thermistors to gather all of our pipe temperatures, um, to display our superheat and our subcooling. We've got um, wireless humidity and temperature probes to get that um, temperature and humidity across our coils. 
Um, and all that can be displayed through the app on the big screen to the classroom, which is really nice for the students. And we also have the iManifold Pulse, which is a data acquisition tool, um, like a leave behind solution to monitor HVAC systems 24 seven. So it's all the same type of sensors, um, pressures, temperatures, and a three phase power meter that's running nonstop. Awesome. Well, you know what? We, we covered a lot of stuff and, you know, I, I really hope that you as educators uh, got some ideas and some, and some tips and tricks on, on how to basically enhance the educational process for your students. Um, we, we discussed being able to see the refrigerant. Uh, we, we discussed being able to use com system compressors for, for multiple training purposes and also really, you know, teaching and, and the, the whole process of heat pump system operation. And, and the more we can do as educators to, like I said, create a really, really awesome learning environment for our students, uh, then, then we're doing our jobs. There, there are two kinds of teachers out there. There are teachers who teach for the income and there are teachers who teach for the outcome. Uh, nobody teaches to get rich. Nobody teaches to, to become a millionaire. What we do teach for is for the aha moments and when we, when we realize that our students get it, when they understand. And what, what always gave me um, great pride was when students who graduated from my programs years prior would come back and they would tell me what they're doing. They would tell me um, the jobs they're, they're, they're working on, telling me about the money they're making and, and telling me about the difference. And uh, one, of my, one of my relatives, he's a, an orthopedic surgeon. And he, for years, would, would look down at me. You know, and it was always about the money. And he would say, oh, well, you're a teacher. Well, what do you make? And I looked at him and said, I make a difference. What do you make? Well, thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions for me or need to get in contact with me, my contact information will be, will be provided. But, you know, have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun in the classroom and make a difference. Take care. <laughs>